Hello and welcome to our next line in our webinar series. This is the 38th and uh, subject is uh, something different, something interesting. And as always, it's been taken in from the request from our dear attendees who have been attending for like we've been online for more than three years now. And um, so this is uh, on behalf of what has been asked for or seen as a relevant uh, requirement across the Middle East in the especially in the in the UAE. Uh, so this is NASA compliance and how does it actually matters to you and now I'm glad that many people are there and so many have actually logged on and uh, now it, it is very well possible that there would be some of you who would not even be aware of who would not even be coming under the ambit of uh, um, uh, NASA, but that really doesn't matter uh, because this, the standard is so beautifully written. It's so well written uh, that will really help you in, in improvise on your own uh, regulation framework on your own compliance framework. So and as always as we go ahead with the webinar uh, do feel free to drop me a line in case you are facing any um, uh, what am I what am I say as uh, a technical difficulty or you're not able to hear me or if you have any sort of uh, Queries to drop it in the question box and I will take it up and it could be something that is very much uh, you know um, Confidential because your client or your own company is going through some particular state like that so you can always message me in confidence and uh, I'll take it up, uh, you know, on a one-to-one -one basis. Maybe I will reply to you. So typically speaking, there are numerous queries that comes up, and uh, unfortunately, I cannot take them up at all the time. But I do promise you that um, I will get back to you on a one-to-one -one basis, and uh, you know, respond to you um, on whatever your queries might be. So going ahead. <clears throat> What we are looking at as the objective, we will be looking at a few key things that is uh, learning about the key NASA compliance uh, regulation, <clears throat> understanding the importance of NASA compliance in the UE, then with the implications for non compliance in case you don't apply, you don't adhere to it, then what happens? Um, then how to prepare for NASA compliance in case you're going ahead for it. So uh, that is there. Then the brief background to the entire UE uh, cybersecurity. Um, <clears throat> landscape then understanding the scope of compliance many many things actually as you can read it and preparing for the NASA compliance finally uh, compliance audit and what does the NASA compliance say about uh, uh, data encryption and stuff like that okay so going ahead <clears throat> Uh, you can uh, really request you and suggest you to subscribe to a YouTube channel. You can see the link online and all the past webinars are there. There's like dozens and dozens of videos are there. All the past webinars, the conferences that we attend, there are many videos on uh, ethical hacking, our top 10 in web, mobile, everything is covered over there. So it's really uh, very informative. Uh, you can always uh, you know subscribe to it. And uh, this is my favorite philo philosopher, De Cortes, and that is something as I always uh, quote him. That is, it's not the question, uh, it's not the answer that enlightens. It's always <clears throat> the question. So, uh, so keep your questions coming, whatever uh, the question may be, and um, I promise you that I will take it up on that. And this is a brief profile about me, and uh, of course, many of you know me. Uh, but again, uh, this puts a face to the voice. Uh, I have my own company, Vista InfoSec. I'm myself a PCI QP, QSA, CSSP, CRISC, uh, CISA, ISO 27, and stuff. I've been for more than 25 years actually uh, in this industry. <clears throat> my company has been there for like um, 2004, so it's like 16th year of operations. And this is a brief about my company. Of course, I won't talk much about it. Established in 2004, uh, we have got our office in 2005. We have been there in the US since 2004. We incorporated last year in uh, Singapore. And now we have our office now in USA. We are there as a QPA2 um, <coughs> in this year itself. And this is a brief on our service offering. This will give you a good idea as to where we are coming from. This webinars is like a accumulation of the experience that we have gathered over the thousands of assignments that you've done over the years, the um, conferences that we speak to, the webinars that we hold. So this is all like the essence of what we have been through, uh, what we have experienced and supported our clients in all these years. 
uh, so there is a compliance and governance service. We literally have like separate departments for this in our company. Uh, there's a risk and security where we do all this VAPT, web app sec, red team assessment, social engineering. <clears throat> Then of course there is a tech advisory wherein our tech team is there helping you close the findings and uh, as a company we don't sell any hardware any software we are totally vendor neutral it's 16 years and the code of ethics has not changed and uh, of course as a part of our services we also do RBI NPC requirements HIPAA SOX even SOC 1 SOC 2 requirements GDPR NASA is there MASTRM is there as a compliance framework in Singapore uh, CCP is there in uh, California PDP is there again in Singapore and Southeast Asia. So all these compliance frameworks is something that we excel in and uh, We have our own training online portal also uh, called academia compliance and These are a few of the certification or stroke attestation services wherein we are doing PCI PA PCI pin SOC 1 SOC 2 we are also there on CCM and uh, there is of course gdpr is there that we are there and npci audits um, cc cp audits that is uh, card personalization audits uh, is something that we do <clears throat> okay um, so there are quite a few queries already uh, trickling in as as i go on i will answer it out because i've not yet got into the core of it so i will but i will come to it Okay, we have our own um, uh, compliance framework, not compliance, our own service offering for NASA compliance uh, uh, online, which is there on a website. You can visit our website and you can see it. Uh, you'll get a lot more information. There are many articles uh, because this webinar will not be that exhaustive. There are many, many articles on our website on NASA compliance. We dedicated a lot of information onto it. The reason being that uh, if you do a search on NASA compliance on the internet, you'd barely get any information. There will hardly be any webinars or seminars or recorded lectures. So this webinar is supposed to be filling in that gap. The articles online is supposed to be filling in the gap and I really hope uh, you like it. And these are a few of the clients, uh, local and international that we've worked with. Uh, and you can uh, go through it. And okay, I'm just brazing through my uh, uh attendee listing and i'm honored to have uh, my uh, you know somebody from whom i learned quite a bit and i really respect it is mr sudarshan mandiam i uh, i hope you can hear me sir and welcome and my um, i don't know i'm running at a loss of words you are attending my webinar thank you so much for being there and uh, he he was one of the people who has actually written um, uh, the ISO 27001 framework before that BSI now is there heading CPG um, which is like a certification body he was, he was there he's himself a PCI QSA and I did my uh, first 27,000 audit in 2004 and he was the auditor and I learned a phenomenal amount from him so welcome sir anyway so going ahead um, towards the end of the webinar of course there would be a brief uh, survey please do fill it up uh, okay coming back to the background to uae's uh, cyber security landscape now over here um, as we see this is yeah okay quoted from a popular uh, newspaper a newspaper in the gulf which is gulf today in the uae uh, just in the month of june there's been like a hundred thousand cyber uh, cyber attacks foiled just in the uae foiled means uh, they stopped it so that is good work on the basis of for them um, for, for the uae cyber uh, security authorities uh, but i'm sure that there are a lot more than hundred thousand many might, might not have even got reported and it very well unfortunately possible that uh, uh, some even got through um, so again uh, there again in the federal government of the ua revealed that cyber attacks varied from malware which is 73 percent vulnerabilities for 15 percent and phishing attacks for 12 percent so malware probably i guess mostly would be on the ransomware front and ae in you know, arab emirates cert uh, handled 407 cyber incidents for email fraud unauthorized access um, you know 50 50 medium risk cases 50 to severe risk cases and uh, five uh, would be low risk cases <clears throat> there are quite a few queries please give me a moment guys i'll come to the queries as soon as i get onto the actual subject uh, please uh, okay uh, regulatory uh, bodies around the world are taking necessary issues but that's where the national electronic security authority is one such re recognized regulatory and governing body in the uae which is established to tackle the information security threats in the country 
now the nasa was tasked with the responsibility of securing the critical the keyword over here is critical information infrastructure and improving national cyber security now there is some niches in this i'll come to that too for you the nasa regulation so it is for providing it is for protecting uae's critical information infrastructure it was established in 25th june 2014 and they announced setting up new guidelines for and standards for strengthening cyber security across the country now the new standard which was known as is was set up to uh, secure the critical information infrastructure and improve ni national cyber security so what it means per se is that uh, as you will see as we go ahead is that those companies and those processes which can affect adversely or which have any uh, you know support onto the country's critical uh, infrastructure or services that come under nisa so that's where uh, they, they were all a part of the national cyber security program now compliance with nisa is for all mandatory for all entities who are identified as critical national service providers now uh, you know i cannot take the name of that body but uh, just uh, you know recently i was uh, called for working on a business continuity plan for one of the key um, bodies in uh, uae um, and i worked with them for some time and i was very surprised you know because we have worked on many business continuity assignments and um, you know rarely rarely we get to see very strong senior management involvement them being present in all the meetings them providing inputs and being there for the trainings is that and everything and honestly speaking i was a bit uh, surprised as to why why are everybody sitting here like this and it's good that they are i'm happy that they are but why is this happening why is this so i i asked uh, you know the senior guy over there i asked him uh, sir uh, mr x rather and uh, why uh, you know why is your organization doing business continuity management primarily speaking uh, he said yeah just for the uptime and ensuring you know that you are able to provide the services and uh, i said see for whatever you are providing it is irreplaceable in the sense that tomorrow something happens and you are unable to provide whatever service that you are providing for a few hours or a few days it is not that the people can go and contact another vendor and you know take their service that services from them because they were into that level of work okay you can i cannot get into <laughs> taking the names of what the service was but it is nothing which could be that you can just go out and take from somebody else so uh, he said uh, see we come under this nasa guidelines and stuff and uh, we get audited every year by external auditors and we are supposed to be getting a five star rating and if we don't get a five star rating we have to give a written explanation to the king as to why we were unable to maintain the high qualities i said what if you get a four star he said yeah we are in trouble what about three he said if i get three i'll get sacked and below with that people even might even get arrested for willful negligence so that is the level of seriousness so they were it was mandatory for all entities identified as critical national service providers so it is all those bodies were coming under it so it is not just uh, you know public bodies like public undertakings but even for private undertakings so uh, that was one of the questions that somebody had asked in the question box so it is even for private entities and not just public entities but even public entities have to adhere to it so objective is very simple to help organizations strengthen and secure the it infrastructure and then secure business critical information and prevent risk of a data breach and theft and loss and stuff <clears throat> and then establish the relevant authorities uh, policies procedures and then promote cyber security awareness across uh, multiple industry verticals and then uh, enable the development of human resources and ensure it security readiness in an organization this you have taken from their do documents only <clears throat> now what is the scope of nasa to whom all does it apply to now this is where the trick is now this is where it gets dicey this is where it gets tricky so it this also answers a few other questions that people have been have asked on the question board uh, so to get down to it nasa doesn't have a fixed scope for its application and implementation so this ensures that anybody and everybody uh, complies with nasa in some way or the other it is recommended for all organizations so you cannot say we are very small we have only have 20 people 50 people we can't do it you have to do it so if it is something that is critical for the companies for the country's 
security of time or provision of services and stuff you better do it so organizations are expected to comply with IA standards through a, a very uh, thorough risk assessment procedures and just to add over here the risk assessment in IS and something on the lines of what we see in ISO so it is not an asset asset based but more of a thread based or a process based approach that has to be applied asset base is uh, no, not really acceptable so this helps in identifying all your critical assets business data and then it enables the management to address all the security control related issues now who should comply it is mandatory for all uae government entities and other entities so it is public and private which is identified as critical national service by nasa so it is not that you, you will get a letter from nasa that you better comply to it even you have to understand on yourself that okay i'm providing this x service okay it could be that uh, there's this uh, bank is there this uh, big bank and i'm a service provider to that bank maybe i am a switching service provider or maybe i'm a payment gateway provider or maybe i'm a card distributor or whatever and my services is critical to them and their services is critical to the country so in that case i have to comply with the uh, nasa guidelines now look, look at it uh, it's a set of guidelines mandatory for all entities and stakeholders who deal with critical national information or provide such services and for those entities that do not fall they are however recommended to follow the guidelines voluntarily now uh, it is expected that all organizations uh, proactively involved and be a part of the initiative now that is where the and nasa's ia standard information assurance standards so nasa has set up the standard called as ias information assurance standard to address the concerns for information security risk and threats now it is based on uh, various guidelines like nist it, uh, it draws heavily from iso but it's come up with a beautiful framework as you will see going on and on comes over here so there are uh, the standard also comes several strategies policies and guidelines that are aligned with the cyber security compliance in uae so as for the global as per the uh, country's guidelines for cyber security compliance this is very much in tandem so you're not be doing anything new but just be building upon it so nasa's nasa has a thread based approach and the and there are security management controls to help you out with that so the is standards work as a guide for organizations in establishing relevant security controls it's more as i said earlier uh, uh, see yeah as i said earlier there are uh, it is a thread based approach and not really an asset based earlier um, earlier days prior to say iso 27001 2013 that is from 2005 to 2000 uh, up till 2013 an asset based approach to risk assessment was acceptable in uh, what to say in um, uh, iso 27001 but post uh, 2013 the version that came there was a process based uh, approach so here they have a thread based and or process based that you have to do um, um, you know identify the uh, the risk to an organization so every security control was uh, mapped is designed with the purpose to mitigate most of the identified threats so over here again um, the security controls are also provided for you to be able to identify as to what could be coming uh, as a relevance to your organization and so this bridges the gap between the it risk and the business risk because then you are doing a thread based approach ki what can impact the business what can impact the information security posture of the organization and this is something that you need to be uh, aware of <clears throat> so they they come as a, as i said earlier from iso 27001 and nist so there are 188 requirements divided into two categories primarily is the management controls and the next would be the technical security controls which includes the uh, 128 controls so management is 60 technical controls is 128 you can quickly just go through it and you can see how well it is in tandem with iso 27001 and nist
so uh, one is the management side over here the m1 m2 m m3 up till m6 uh, strategy and planning information security risk management awareness hr security compliance and performance evaluation and improvement uh, for those stalwarts of iso and nist you can see that these are the mandatory controls you have to have these things in place you cannot say i cannot afford it or it's not a risk for me now the the choice with regards to what you might want to do it comes under the asset management or the technical security controls so here there is t1 to t9 again in the uh, the controls are not uniformly uh, you know like distributed across this so it is not that uh, m1 to m6 there are 10 controls each and then uh, t1 to t9 there are x numbers of controls each totaling up to uh, you know 128 controls in totality they are uh, variedly distributed now this is something out of the 128 one, 188 security requirements 35 management controls are considered mandatory so regardless of your size regardless of anything the 35 requirements out of the 60 in management controls are considered as mandatory and the second part is none of the technical controls are mandatory and even in this this is the beauty of it i would really request you and suggest you that if you have some time download the standard it's free and go through all the uh, priority levels over there p1 to p4 in the technical security part where p1 is the highest priority and p4 is the lowest priority this is again based on your risk assessment because you are doing your uh, risk assessment based on a threat based approach so based on the severity of threats there are, there are controls there's a technical controls and a part of management controls listed as a part of uh, you know uh, severity that is p1 to p4 so based on the risk management approach that you might have and the outcome from that you you might want to pick up the controls over here and then every security control further is called classified into sub controls document uh, requirements performance indicators so it is extremely extensive so here the is standards for the implementation or the compliance is looking at the entire if i might give a rough example is a pdca cycle so again this is not a pdca pdca but it looks a bit different so there here we have the establishing implementing maintaining and improving I can still say PDCA, but uh, you know this is how they are naming it. So it's so good for them, and I respect it. And it's a it's a good way of referencing it also. Uh, you know, establishing, implementing, maintaining, and improving. So again, the the compliance process here involves understanding what the company is all about then looking then doing the 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 risk assessment then identifying the appropriate measure for the risk treatment now identifying the necessary control and then finally reviewing the effectiveness and then ensuring continual compliance of the information security systems now all these steps the six steps that you saw here or see here on the screen or what i've speak uh, what i've spoken is very close to uh, what we see in say an ISO 27001 or NIST guidelines it starts up with the same thing that is understand what the organization is about do a do a gap analysis required then move into a risk assessment do a risk treatment and then finally implement whatever controls uh, you recommended to be implemented after that you need to monitor and review the effectiveness and then ensure continual compliance now this is what i was talking about so the four steps um, reporting <clears throat> auditing testing and then national security intervention you need to pay attention to the last part now this is the compliance audit process so uh, you need to do this first three steps on your own and if required um, even nasa might step in if there is some sort of a indicator that you that you are not working in the right way or uh, they might suspect some irregularities so they might step in in a proactive way and take it up so in that case uh, reporting would be more on a self-assessment with the mandatory compliance requirements uh, now after that if required the nisa might consider might conduct an audit on their own and request for specific evidences so this is where i always say that go in for an auditor who can stand with you so a few times rather we have seen people going in for auditors who can do this at the cheapest uh, way possible in the least amount of time to possible so uh, please understand that those the work done becomes suspect tomorrow if there is a, a issue and nisa uh, comes to a door doorstep would you be in a position to justify what you saw 
or what happened in the audit and the auditor if he is not able to present himself maybe he is working remotely from xyz country so if the person is if the auditor is not there to present himself and take liability then what happens right then after that uh, there is nasa uh, who can also the testing part that it can run a test based on the claims uh, you know that you might have made and in the most extreme extreme case uh, nasa may directly intervene and uh, uh, in the compliance audit process and if they find any activities which are very uh, in a high level of risk to the national security then there'll be a lot of issues that you can expect okay <clears throat> now so what does nasa say about data encryption so here the organizations now why i put this as a separate issue why because many a time uh, you know companies don't look at all these data encryption and all those things very seriously this is in our experience when we have audited a few companies for uh, 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 you know with regards to um, data encryption they might not be fully ready they would say okay we are doing some encryption here and there but over here it, it's a part of the mandatory controls so uh, it is required to for you to encrypt and hold uh, along with a very good key management process okay now a couple of quick questions there is mr hanif is asked a nice questions are universities in uae are required to comply with nasa requirements the answer is yes they are required to comply with uh, uh, you know nasa requirements also but uh, you know again it, it's a risk based approach so based on what activities it could be like your university is also a richer uh, also has a uh, research uh, it's like a research guidelines are there and you're doing a lot of critical research for the for the country so in that case you might even be considered as a part of critical infrastructure but as nasa guidelines are concerned everybody every company is recommended to go ahead with uh, this implementing the is standards in a uh, voluntary manner now okay the next thing okay from where can we download uh, the nasa uh, ia uh, information insurance standards which is the nasa guidelines the nasa website is there i i towards the end i will post it up uh, you know from where you can download it that's not a problem uh, now which is the authority that ensures uh, audit compliance of nasa now okay now i can uh, this is a good question uh, i think okay uh, yeah, this is Mr. Raghu Raman. So uh, thank you so much for this question, Raghu Raman, Mr. Raghu Raman. And uh, you see, the problem is that um, there are two levels of audits that we're talking about. One is something that you might do on an internal audit basis. So in that case, uh, there is nothing like, uh, you know, NASA has appointed a panel of companies like how we have in India, like the certain is there and, uh, uh, you know, the, the organizations are identified. But here, uh, you know, there is nothing like that. Uh, it is up to you to identify the proper company, but then again, you have to be in a position to then the liability is yours. You can't say that okay, Nisa doesn't lay any guidelines, so I went ahead and I appointed a jackass who did whatever nonsense audit. The the Nisa would hold you responsible for the audit diligence that was being done. So you better appoint a good auditor who knows the subject who's got a good standing in the market and who will be there to support you in case there is a nasa violation or uh, they come in for some testing or some uh, you know uh, on their own if they come to audit you and they'll be there with you for example we stand with the clients wherever they are doing any sort of audits uh, we are there with them so uh, go in for an auditor where we are uh, where, where they are there where they are standing with you on nasa so <clears throat> it is very important otherwise you will be in a lot of trouble uh, uh, uh. okay so there is a nice question that uh, miss venisha has asked uh, what is the best approach for someone who is beginning the journey uh, to announcing the security can the can taking the 35 management control plus p1 controls from nasa is a good start well now i'm not sure where you're coming from on this venisha but there are two points to this i can see two angles in which i can answer this question angle number one that is your i don't know what your company is and it's okay you don't need to share but 
uh, Vinisha, it is very well possible that you, you, are, you might be asking from the level that your company is required to be doing NESA. So then uh, can I, uh, you are asking that you, whether you can take that position. That is you implement the mandatory and you go in for the P1 requirements. Well, now that is not really your choice. Whether you are implementing P1 or P4, uh, you know, uh, P1, P1 level controls are P2 or P3 or P4. Uh, deciding that is based on, again, to be precise, the technical controls are not mandatory. It's up to you to define. But it is recommended that you go ahead with the, uh, you know, suggested controls. But whether you go for P1 or P2 or P3 or P4, that depends on the risk that you are facing. So the risk levels are high you might need it be needed to go in for the higher risk rating controls and if you look at it over here p1 has the highest priority and p4 has the lowest priority so if you're starting off you might want to consider p4 rather than p1 when uh, com coming again it is more on the risk assessment now the second angle to your question vinita that i might uh, vinisha that i um, i can see is that per perhaps you're not coming directly under nesa but you want to use nesa for enhancing the security posture of your organization so in that case again i would suggest you to uh, you know uh, this is my way okay this is my my thought process do a risk assessment um see what at least get an understanding of what controls of p1 your organization requires what controls of p2 you are requiring what controls of p3 are requiring and what controls of p4 you are requiring requiring interact with your management to you know uh, let them know what risk is being faced and then maybe you can set up a risk statement uh, plan rtp for uh, when you are going to implement the p2 or p3 and p4 and then start off with a p1 but if you're implementing, if your organization is in uh, uh, direct compliance uh, required, as far as NISA is concerned, then it's really not much of a choice. You can't say, I'll implement P1 now and P4 I'll do sometime else. Uh, or rather I can do P4 now and then uh, do P1 later on. Uh, let me start off with the lowest and then move to the higher ones. Uh, that is something which is uh, not admissible. So I hope I've answered your question, Vinisha. Thank you again. Okay, the next question, uh, how would you recognize? Oh, uh, okay, uh, this is a nice question. My question is how would you recognize the intervention is genuine? Uh, and it is, uh, you know, and it is legit genuine and legit as they don't normally identify themselves and ask sensitive details to share. See, uh, Mr. Ram, uh, whenever I have seen our clients or when your uh, companies have been asked for data by by NASA, they are always written from genuine NASA IDs. Nobody would write to you from a uh, what to say um, a Gmail ID or a Hotmail ID and stuff like that. It is always from a very genuine. Uh, official ID that's written and uh, just to prevent any sort of phishing I would suggest you to uh, you know uh, I would suggest you to uh, check and maybe call them back or write them back and ensure that the email address is not a phishing uh, you know email address so instead of nesa.org you got a email address from uh, nese.org or nasa no, that's NASA. <laughs> okay, uh, so nisa.org, and you miss seeing what the domain is, and then you pass on uh, genuine information. Uh, so do ensure that it's not like a phishing attack. Otherwise, uh, I have found that the government authorities in the UAE are extremely well informed. Uh, they are not the typical bureaucratic, you know, janta that we get to see in other places. Uh, they are well informed and they are highly professional and uh, you know the commitment levels are there so even if you have if they have come up with an intervention you can very well discuss it up with them go meet them and uh, sometimes you know they might not even disclose why they are asking you and honestly speaking you don't have the rights to ask them all that um, unless you want to take it up legally but i wouldn't suggest the legal angle for you okay going ahead uh, <clears throat> Wow, there is another, uh, there are too many questions, Sadhar. Okay, I'll just take a one or two and move on. Okay, data encryption, do we need to enable it in all the database level fields? Uh, well, that's a good question. Now, again, 
these are all technical controls mandatory uh, part of data encryption also comes under mandatory uh, data encryption of all the data that is important to the organization and that can get misused have to get encrypted unlike pci it doesn't tell you what exactly the data can be it all depends on the risk assessment that you're doing so uh, it has to be the other way around rather if you are excluding some data from from encryption you better have a reason as to why you are excluding so in case there is an issue tomorrow and somebody asks you you have a reason and say i excluded column number one five and seven because of one two three reasons that's what i would suggest okay uh harshit okay that's a good question are there any companies appointed by nasa to uh, conduct external audits yes uh, there are and uh, they are appointed by nasa uh, but there is nothing like a publicized uh, list for that uh, because nasa cannot really afford to be everywhere at all times they do appoint companies to do this audits but these are appointed by nasa they have an appointment letter from nasa and typically before they come they would even be sending you an official mail by from nasa that xyz person would be coming maybe with some identification and all extremely well organized so that's they do a point but there is nothing like uh, how in say pci ds or in say pci uh, council we have uh, appointed pci qsas or pci qpas and you know pa qpas and stuff like that who are appointed for doing their external audit so nothing like that here they come or they send somebody else Okay. <clears throat> yeah, uh, yeah, somebody said yes, they can actually come to office physically with a phone call asking to connect to the C level. Uh, yes, they can, but uh, they can come to your office, but you, I'm sure that, uh, um, you know, you will have uh, you know, the sense to ask them, that is, uh, please, can I see some identification? so uh, all those things are there they they unless it is i've in a personally not experienced nasa guys just dropping in at your office unless uh, what you are referring to as an instance could be a super critical issue where nasa just dispatched people without any uh, you know pre information otherwise they might have come i don't know for what context they came to this company that you're referring but they can come and uh, but you have the right to ask them what it is about so they are more like a, if I might use the word, I hope I'm using the right word. They are more like a policing authority. And uh, so as with the police, unless there is a, a critical case, they won't just, you know, jump into at your home and pick you up unless there is some really something for them to be worried about and they have the right documentation in place. Otherwise, uh, they might just give you a call and ask you as to we got this and can we uh, ask you to come down to the police station and stuff like that. So uh, that's how it is with these guys also. Very, very nice people actually. Uh, okay. Okay, per NISA requirements, can entities uh, data reside outside the country? Uh, from what we understand, that's not really allowed. Uh, uh, but that is pertaining to, again, critical country information, financial information, which is for most companies that is not allowed. Okay. Uh, okay, there are too many questions. I'll, I'll take it up, guys. Let me just go ahead with the uh, uh, audit. Uh, sorry, with the, with the session. Okay, we've seen this. Okay, now this is a control specification from NASA. And here we have extracted the NASA's cryptography security controls and requirements uh, to highlight the importance given to data data encryption. Now, again, as I said, we have uh, taken up specifically data encryption because there have been an instance, there have been many instances where companies have not realized that data encryption is also required as a part of, uh, you know, um, NASA and it is mandatory for them. So uh, look, look at over here. Uh, for example, 5.1.0 data hosted at a non-entity owned facility should be subject to strong encryption protection at rest and below this requirement there are guidelines and uh, what you should actually be doing to fulfill this requirement there are some guidelines given for that also and look at this workflow approval within information system should be supported via the use of digital infra uh, signatures using pki public key cryptography but again public key crypto cryptography digital signatures uh, this uh, uh, is again comes under as a part of encryption and non-repudiation 
data data of classification confidential or above trans transiting or a wireless network should be subject to strong encryption to protect its confidentiality now again the the definition of strong has not been that well clarified as what we see say in a pci but again here uh, the the owner shifts on you so if you say no no instead of aes 256 i decided to go in for aes 128 so in that case if it is a super critical company data the question may rebound back to you with the question as to what gave you the impression that uh, uh, aes 128 would be good enough for your organization so then the onus falls on you to uh, define and give a convincing order to the nice auditor or the inspection specialist or unfortunately if it happens a forensic guy so and how does it work basically just like a short primer we have done uh, this earlier also in pci pen we have completed we have covered uh, in one of the other webinars on pci pen i think three webinars back if i'm not mistaken uh, where we have covered data encryption and how does it work in detail we just put some information over here so it is basically the process of transfer transforming or encoding sensitive data into random characters that cannot be read without having the access to the uh, correct key and a decryption process if i might add that so there is a lot of scrambling and for encryption and securing the sensitive information that happens then the data that can be encrypted can only be decrypted with the person with the people who have the decryption keys now data encryption is the most effective cryptographic solutions for implementing strong measures and is the best technique for encrypting sensitive data now over here as i said there is no hundred percent like how we have in pci that this is the data that needs to be encrypted it is all has to be an outcome of your risk-based approach that you have and what is the uh, infrastructure that you have in place as you prepare for nasa compliance Okay, a nice question. Does NISA mandate any qualification certification that an auditor must possess in order to carry out the audit? See, it speaks about due diligence and ensuring that uh, for uh, for you to ensure that organizations are hiring the right auditors. But there is nothing like a, uh, what qualification can, and credentials has to be there. That is something that not even PCI DSS supports. So uh, you're supposed to be having the audit done by uh, appropriately configured and empowered uh, auditor so i hope that helps one sec please okay <clears throat> so uh, this is how you prepare for nisa compliance as you start off scan and assess the entire system environment by scan is vapt plus other all these process also to identify what, uh, where and what is the sensitive data in your organization that will help you understand the scope of compliance then you do a scanning of the entire organization to identify that type of data so it could be that you are storing the privacy private data of the citizens or it could be you're storing the data of uh, the bureaucrats working in the organization or it could be some specific uh, you know tender data or it could be um, you know maybe your billing for your uh, electricity or water or it could be your billing for maybe your postal services and so there are many other things that is there that can be identified as sensitive data so you need to uh, use one tool or the other to uh, identify the sensitive data identify the areas that store the sensitive data in the organization um hello one sec Oh man, somebody just flagged me that the presentation was not visible. So I've made it visible again. I hope you can see it. 
So scan and assess the entire system and environment, understand the scope of the compliance, use appropriate tools to scan and identify the sensitive data in the organization and identify the areas that store the sensitive data, classify the sensitive data based on the risk levels, create an inventory based on which you can do your uh, risk assessment, then develop a relevant framework for and policies for data protection, include data protection in your data protection strategies, and then find, finally use the right data protection software systems for securing your data. It is very important that you go through these steps to ensure that you are uh, falling in line with uh, NISA compliance. Okay, enforcement of, of uh, NISA compliance. Uh, NISA compliance, again, uh, enforcement as we saw earlier is based on a four-tier approach. So again, uh, it is self-assessment by organizations in line with the mandatory and voluntary IS requirements. That's the reportment where you are supposed to do the self-assessment. Now, again, over here, uh, again, over here, uh, see, it speaks about self-assessment. Now, as a company, we are uh, uh, even say a PCI DSS certifying body. We do PCI PIN, we do SOC 1, SOC 2, GDPR, HIPAA, all these things, plus we do even do NASA, MAS, DRM. Now, the point is that in PCI DSS, you have a concept of an SAQ, self-assessment questionnaire, where PCI council has allowed organizations to do a self-assessment on their own and submit the reports if required. But many companies still insist on identifying and employing proper QSAs who can do the audits. Why is that? Well, the thing is very simple. That is tomorrow, if there is an issue, they can be seen as have they have been have done the best that is possible to ensure compliance and then the liability or the responsibility also shifts to the auditor so even though the self-assessment is encouraged for reporting by organization with regards to the mandatory and voluntary is requirements it is always recommended i'm saying recommended underline it's not mandatory as per nasa to uh, uh, to employ a third party auditor many companies are doing say quarterly audits on nasa that we have seen and what they do is that they will then <coughs> employ the auditor maybe once a year so they'll do three audits and the external auditor will do one audit so before the final audit that is so these uh, these things uh, are something that uh, are strategies that you can use uh, and when considered appropriate nasa can intervene now this what do you mean by when considered appropriate nasa can intervene see it is up to them in the sense they might have heard something or somebody might have complained or they they they, they see your organization as a potential hackers uh, target and they want to ensure that uh, confirm rather that you are you are doing what is best best required for safeguarding the data so in that case the the nisa the nisa can uh, you know um, intervene and request their organization for submitting the reports and then testing they can test if they are not happy with the report they can test some of it it's themselves and uh, see for example even in india for example we have seen that is there is certain is there computer emergency response team india like how it is ae cert in uh, the uae and for critical organizations to the uh, country certain themselves come and done the and does audit uh, in addition to what they are doing themselves so that is something where the testing part comes into place and then in the extreme case uh, nisa may directly uh, intervene and take steps maybe it could be penalty it could be uh, you know corrective measures to ensure that the uh, uh, that whatever activities are uh, being done by this organizations are not leading to an unacceptable level of national security risk so the baseline is protect the country now penalties everybody is asking for penalties okay there's another nice question does compliance with is by nasa ensure complete or some level of compliance with the data privacy regulations such as gdpr in some way yes but gdpr is too extensive too extensive too precise i am say that in a good way so uh, i can put it in a way that if you comply with gdpr then the privacy requirements of nasa are well taken care of
so um, it is recommended as I'm saying again um, all organization within the UA to comply to NASA's IA standards even recommend for organizations that do not fall in the scope comply with the standards and uh, see understand NASA has not mentioned any specific penalties for non-compliance it's up to it's up to them how to uh, uh, you know respond to it and what action to take now uh, organizations must realize that in case they are uh, in case they are providing any sort of service which are considered um, critical for that for their organization then they must um, then they must be looking at implementing nasa now direct ex uh, now look at the last two points um, there will be a risk of scrutiny in case there is an issue high level escalation from the regulatory bodies and direct intervention if nasa directly intervenes there will be expensive audits that uh, like somebody asked what about the external audits done by nasa in all these things if there is an issue you will be made to pay for the audit not nasa won't pay for it you will be made to pay for it and in case there is a finding then there will be the increased compliance requirements additional uh, control requirements there could be possible lawsuits even monetary penalties for willful default so all these things are there so they take this very very seriously and uh, i would really suggest you to do the same now nisa just to summarize again nisa is considered mandatory for organizations <laughs> Critical by NASA, considered critical by NASA. For those organizations who do not fall in the scope of NASA, they are still expected to voluntarily participate in the effort. And uh, non-compliance will be severe ramifications. Severe ramifications. And again, as I said, those people are extremely professional. Uh, they will not just uh, be happy sitting with uh, you know in a room with uh, some biscuits and tea and everything is fine. So they were they are not like that. They are very professional. And many of the people, uh, you know, the team is extremely skilled uh, so do ensure that you work in a way that you do not call upon yourself uh, a nasa audit to happen and as i said earlier uh, it's very well possible that they might apply um, a third person also to do the audit and that is a key takeaway with regards to understanding what is nasa all about and that's a big thank you for attending the webinar it's been like um, slightly about the time and as a gentle reminder there is a survey at the end of uh, this webinar please do fill in your feedback please provide uh, some uh, clear thoughts on what can be uh, upcoming webinar uh, points that we, that we can cover your your opinion is very important for us even if it is critical please do share it so that uh, we can improve on it if it is if it is good then again it helps uh, increase the client uh, increase our team quite a bit these are the few of the past webinars that we have had so far um, you can go through it like 38 these are like the uh, 38 standards 38 links uh, sorry 38 uh, webinars uh, that you've done so far this is 38 in progress you can quickly go through it and you'll understand um, okay Yes, and as I said, there is uh, so many of them, HIPAA, SOC 2, GDPR, ISO, and PCIDSS, NIST guidelines, FDA CFR Part 11, SOC 2 in 90 days, seven steps for uh, NIST compliance, PCIDSS scoping, uh, SOC 2 and CCM. Then we even had the pleasure of, uh, you know, um, a, a hosting in one of the past webinars, the Associate Director for India, Mr. Nitin Bhatnagar, who's a good friend, and he spoke on the uh, meeting the payment security needs now and for the future that is also there on our youtube page so please uh, visit us online uh, that's our youtube page you can just search online vista infosec and you can see us uh, we've got almost 600 odd subscribers also so it is pretty good uh, it's pretty interesting rather uh, that's the official facebook page we regularly print a lot of articles so do like our page and what will happen is that whenever we are posting any articles uh, you will get uh, you know information or updates on the same 
and there's our uh, official LinkedIn page and these are our contact details so I really hope that uh, this webinar was good and uh, you enjoyed and uh, <laughs> do get back to me for any queries there are quite a few um, queries that you have asked and uh, I'll respond to you uh, definitely oh man okay there is there is a link for uh, downloading the latest version I couldn't do it because I was doing this webinar over here it is there online you can just do a search download NISA IS standard guidelines or as a thank you note to this webinar that you have uh, attended I will send you the standard requirements and the link too so my apologies that I couldn't just to uh, toggle between the webinar and the uh, internet and get the file down for you all right so thank you again for your time and stay safe until next time take care bye bye